59 of the legislative session. Uh, I am Representative Pruitt and I am joined here with uh, uh, Representative Burt, Representative Sadler, Representative Newman, and Representative Sullivan Leonard. And um, we are, uh, you know, kind of kind of trudging along here. Uh, you know, just for myself, just kind of in, in kind of where I see we currently find ourselves. Uh, in finance, this has been kind of a weird week. We've had several kind of canceled meetings and whatnot. Uh, as there's been a kind of new shift in uh, direction from the majority, uh, we were working on the budget, and the budget has totally been put on halt. And uh, I, I believe we're going to, we should be working a little bit today on trying to complete the amendment process there. Uh, but we, of course, put it on halt because there was this desire to move towards uh, the uh, constitutional amendment. And I think the uh, public spoke pretty clear earlier this week that this is not the direction and the time to do it. Uh, but two days in which to talk about a monumental generational policy uh, change uh, was probably uh, not a good policy uh, call. So at, I believe it's time, if we want to try to even have a semblance of getting out of here in 90 days. We need to move back towards the budget. We need to focus on getting that budget done. Uh, the, the discussion around revenues is important, but uh, that can also be done in that budget process. So, and as well as I just don't think this is the right, my, personally, I'll speak for myself, that this is not the process from which to make that happen. Uh, with that, I'd like to um, just kind of kind of go around and, and ask each of our members to have a, take a few moments to, to speak about something. Representative Sadler. Thank you very much, Lance. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm actually tickled this week. I've got uh, uh, one of my, my, my favorite bills this session, my House Bill 260, which would authorize uh, Alaskans to carry their hunting, fishing, or trapping licenses on a digital form instead of just a paper copy. It's up for resources on Friday, and I'm looking forward to uh, some good public testimony, and I hope with the kind of cooperation of the members to pass it out. You know, smartphones are an indispensable part of my life and many Alaskans, and I think that uh, they could do a good job making it easier, more convenient for people to comply with our fish and game laws. They should entice new participants by making it easier to get a license. Might make Alaska a more attractive place for tourists to come and get a quick license to go out and fishing. And uh, it holds the promise to improve compliance with fish and game laws. If people have their licenses, then uh, they can always be in compliance. I'm looking forward to hearing from the public about how digital licenses might help them improve their experience. And uh, maybe we can leave fish and game management into the 21st century with add-ons in the future that would improve reporting and harvest tags and so forth. So I'm looking forward to this. Uh, Representative Newman. Thank you, Representative Pruitt. Um, I'm going to continue to talk about the economy and diversifying the economy. We continue to hear how we need to use all the tools that we have in this toolbox, that everything that we have available, and we're not doing that. We have some projects in this state. We just talked about the road to Juneau. Uh, Representative Pruitt tried to get that some money into that to help Southeast here. These are the kind of economic opportunities we should be looking at. I've got information on the Knick Arm Crossing, some of these programs. We could adding billions of dollars into our economy that have shown to save the state money. And I wouldn't certainly be, don't, do not promote economic development just to create jobs. Um, but this is, these are good programs that uh, have proved themselves to be able to financially viable. But the bottom line is this, is when I continue to talk with the industry in this state, what I've learned is it's when they're trying to do a risk assessment of investments in this state, it's coming out on the wrong side of the ledger. And a lot of that has to do with regulation reform in my view. You know, and, and I can kind of phrase it up this way. You know, we're, we're a state that's supposed to be funding our budget off of the royalty that we get off of developing those resources on state land, the production tax that we get off of them, and then when they make a profit off of them taxes or those resources, they pay a corporate tax. And that's generally been about a 50-50 split in our budget. We've gotten away from that. Um, and I'll just kind of frame it up this way. With all the resources that we have in this state, and there's not a place in the world that does not want to have all the resources we have, <coughs> yet we cannot yet we cannot even sell enough resources in this state to fund a government to oversee the needs of only 700,000 people. And we get over $8 billion from the federal government. What is wrong with this picture? Thank you, Representative Newman. Uh, Representative Burtz? Good morning. Uh, pleased to be here this morning. Uh, uh, 
I represent a, a, a small area of South Anchorage and uh, serve on the state affairs, the uh, state resources, and uh, labor and commerce committees. I've had a, a pretty busy week. Uh, I have to say that as a as a, a new member of the body, uh, I believe 25% of the body is 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 new this year, uh, or this session, I should say. Uh, it's been encouraging to see the increase in dialogue and and discussion going on uh, between members uh, uh, between. Between this body and the other body, uh, you know, we, we have a 90-day target for uh, delivering an operating budget, a capital budget, and and uh, doing the people's business. I'm cautiously optimistic that we can achieve that budget. Uh, we have the tools uh, necessary to balance a budget and produce a budget uh, are are in the in uh, in this building already. We have them in statute. We have the ability to uh, uh, to do the people's work and, uh, and and get that behind us. From the standpoint of of issues. That we're working on in in uh, in the resources. It tends to be on the oil and gas side, and and how we can uh, improve the Alaska's position in the international markets for resource development and investment. That's uh, that's key to our our future. I think from the uh, investment standpoint, uh, we've done very well, and uh, I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll do well down the road. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Representative Burt. And we're going to wrap up with Re Representative Sullivan Leonard. Oh. Thank you, Lance Pruitt. Good to be here today. Thank you, everyone, and good morning. Um, it's been a, a busy couple of weeks with the various committees that I serve on. Uh, Health and Social Services is uh, joining with Depart excuse me, the uh, Education Committee, and we are reviewing early uh, development uh, for childhood adverse uh, effects with regard to education and health and well-being. And, uh, starting from prenatal care, uh, infant stage, preschool on up. And so we're diving deep into that this week uh, with combined with Harriet Drummond's uh, uh, education committee. And so we worked on that yesterday, today, and we'll continue that tomorrow. Uh, Labor and Commerce has been uh, pretty active. We're moving bills pretty quickly through that committee. We have uh, various boards that have had extensions, and so we've moved those through the process. You're seeing those, uh, of course, on the House floor now. And then we're looking at filling seats on the boards and commissions uh, that have open spots right now as well. Um, and then also just want to highlight a little bit on public safety. Um, I, I know, you know, like many here at the table, there's not a day that doesn't go by that we hear from our constituents or businesses um, in our areas that are still very concerned about the, the uh, high sense of crime in our areas. And we know that there are bills in various committees right now that could really help, for example, the pretrial process. Uh, right now we're seeing that repeat access of somebody committing a crime, stealing a car, and, and you know, they come through the pretrial process and they're right back out in the community after a very short time. That's got to stop. And right now there is a, a bill in committee where uh, the administration has identified that they could have access for out-of-state uh, criminal records. And I think that's a real important tool to have. Uh, they should have every, excuse me, our judges should have every access for information possible in order to um, present a sentence to any criminal that's before them. And then uh, just to highlight a little bit on, again, on public safety, um, I've talked to others in my community and, and, you know, so what do we have the tools before us to, to help fight crime? People haven't been talking about it very much lately, but we sure hear about it in our community. Um, I have a bill, HB 394, which addresses a private police process. And I uh, just want to kind of bring it up for discussion today and, and through uh, discussion in the, in the building here. But what it is is you could actually fill the gap between the state troopers that are, you know, professing this incredible shortage of, of uh, state trooper positions that aren't being filled. Well, you can contract with a private police outfit, and that fills that gap. Uh, homeowners associations, our neighbors, uh, businesses. Troy Jarvis, who has uh, had more than 30 vehicles stolen in the last three months, uh, they're all on board. They all want to have uh, safety, more safe uh, areas in their communities and in their businesses. So anyway, that's what I'm working toward, and I thank you. Yeah, well said. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to questions. Uh, uh, Rich, and I think I see Andrew back there. So going to catch our attention. Yeah, hi, Rich Mauer, Channel 2 News. So uh, I was just wondering if the caucus had a position or if any of you people, any of you uh, representatives had opinions individually 
on House Bill 75, which is the um, the bill that would allow for um, for um, some some forms of gun control for people uh, who are adjudicated with mental illness, or at least a temporary me mental illness. Representative Sullivan Leonard. Yeah, I'll take that. Thank you, uh, Rep. Pruitt. You know, it's interesting because we, as we look at the uh, this unsafe situation that we find ourselves in, uh, in, in schools and in the community, really I think part of it is when you try to look at taking away guns like HB 75 may consider, I think it gives you a false sense of security, if you will. If, if there's someone out there that wishes to cause harm, believe me, they're going to cause harm. Um, they don't need a gun to do that. They'll find something. Um, but really, I think there's a deeper root of, of our society uh, that's happening, whether it's the bullying aspect or, or something that really uh, needs to be addressed. Does that mean we should just throw our hands up and not do anything? That's not what I said. Okay. Um, school resource officers are now in place in, in many schools. Uh, they need, I believe, our school districts need to continue to work towards uh, a real active plan for safety. We already have it for earthquakes and other um, emergencies that we have uh, that we are preparing for. This needs to be part of that discussion. Rep. Newman. I have a, a follow-up on that, Rich. Um, when I first started hearing about this bill and it became a little more public last week, the first people I went to were people who work within the court system and asked them how they thought about this. If we talk to the judges about this, I don't think we've even heard from any judges what they think. And one of the largest concerns that I heard was now we're asking judges to be psychologists, basically. Are they going to ask, be asked to decide whether people have psychological issues or not? And how that could affect them in the future down the road, whether it's owning a gun or anything, is, is up in the air. Um, but I, you know, I was also told that our judges will do their job. Um, they'll make decisions that, that if we pass the laws, they'll do their job and make those decisions. But it would be a very difficult position to put judges in. Uh, Andrew. Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Radio Network. Uh, I'm interested in your thoughts on uh, including the permanent fund dividend in the Constitution. Yeah, I'll go ahead and um, uh, take a stab at that. Um, and, and, of course, speaking for myself, the, the, if, if you're really referencing, and I want to make sure that I, I'm framing, is, is the reference towards the current amendment that's in front, or the current resolution that's in front of us, which would be 23, or just kind of in general? Well, it, it could be in general. Um, for instance, uh, would you support a constitutional convention to guarantee the PFD? Yeah, thanks for the question. So um, for myself, the, the issue of enshrining the const anything related to the permanent fund beyond what's currently in there uh, in the Constitution can be problematic. And the reason that it's problematic is because of the fact that, one, it's, it's, there's not the uh, nimble ability from which to uh, change based on challenges that may arise. Let's say, for instance, there is some sort of great natural disaster for which we need to, say, access uh, additional funds. If it's in the Constitution and there's a limit on the ability to be able to utilize some of the funds, here we are, we have a you know, $60 billion fund that we wouldn't be able to access to help get ourselves back on our feet. Now, that's an extreme example, but it, it speaks to why the limiting our ability to be able to do what's necessary uh, can be problematic. Uh, do we need a framework? 100% agree that we need a framework from which to operate under. I believe what we're going to find today, uh, even maybe right now actually, is that the Permanent Fund Corporation is meeting on a resolution. And, and the uh, essentially the gist of that resolution is they need a structure from which to be able to manage our money. They need to know what the intent uh, of the legislature will be in general on how to utilize the earnings reserve or how to utilize permanent fund money. And so we do need a structure, but uh, placing it in the Constitution, I feel, has uh, a, creates a, a, a potential long-term difficult challenge, uh, as well as it doesn't give us, uh, there, is a, there is a piece that's in 26 that I agreed with, and that is a look back. 
because our continued effort, if we use the earnings reserve, we should, as leaders within government, should constantly be focusing on what can we do to use less and less of that money and put it towards government. And, and if you have a constitutional amendment that says there's an automatic amount that's going to go towards government, then we will spend it. That's just what the government has proven they will do. Whereas in it gives us the ability to come back every couple years, if it's not in the Constitution, say, hey, nope, we don't need that much anymore. Let's keep it in the fund. Let's let it keep working. I don't know if any representative no. knows. Andrew, there's a lot of diverse opinions on that. And actually, the legislature and, and the public have been looking at this since 2004 when it was first brought up at the Conference of Alaskans. Um, and quite frankly, it still hasn't been decided. You know, a lot of legislators here, I think every legislator here is representing the people that they work for and their opinions. I know the people in my part of the state um, feel that probably if we were to take the current version that we have right now, and enshrine it in the, in the Constitution would be acceptable. That would be their preference. Uh, you know, and we're representing the views of the people in our district. And that's how diverse our state is. We look, we have different needs in the state. Um, you know, Senator Kelly has said, maybe this is an issue that's going to have to change when the legislature changes make up. I don't know. But I, I, Andrew, I think that most of us are representing the voices of the people in our district. That's our job. Um, and, it's, and I respect that. And that's the only way you're going to get through this, if you do respect the other people's opinions and continue to work through that. But thank you. Representative Birch. The uh, short answer is no. Uh, I, I, I personally don't. And I, again, uh, from my assessment as a 25% uh, of this body is new, uh, and in, in my uh, assessment of uh, this process, uh, it is unrealistic to expect a budget to be passed without using some component of earnings from the permanent fund. Uh, we have a, a two and a half billion dollar uh, deficit on the face of it uh, because of our uh, inability to reduce spending uh, uh, to uh, to a point that matches the two billion dollars in in actual revenues. So uh, some level of earnings from the permanent fund are going to be required to balance the budget. The question is, do you do it in a, a kind of a, a haphazard manner, or do you do it in a, a more structured manner? I I personally support a more structured approach. I think the public is looking for some stability. They're looking for some resolution. They're looking for a path forward. I, I think we need to be working towards a 90-day a, a uh, uh, session. We need to work, to, uh, you know, both bodies need to be working together to find a solution. Uh, it's, it's unrealistic uh, that we not use a portion of the earnings from the permanent fund uh, to balance our budget. Thank you. And, and, and one last piece. There, that's not to say that there isn't an opportunity for a constitutional amendment. But I think based on what we heard the other day, that people are concerned about our utilization of the, this money, government's utilization of the money. And we have some of our members who have offered constitutional amendments that uh, put spending limits. And I think that is <laughs> worth having a conversation over. And we have not heard any discussion from this majority really on that. And I think that uh, there have been several different ways to put a, a constitutional spending limit out there, uh, and we haven't had any conversation. So if we, want, if we want the trust of the public in whatever we may decide to do, we need to be able to uh, ensure them that they can trust us to use that money wisely. Any other thoughts or any other questions? All right, uh, not, uh, not seeing any. Oh. Uh, Rich, one. For Dan, but um, Representative Sadler, uh, do you plan to ensure that smartphones are waterproof? <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> Having wrecked a no my last Nokia, dip netting. Uh, Mr. Maurer, government can only go so far to protect you from yourself. Uh, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, I've actually fallen into the river and got my fishing license all sopping wet and fell apart. So I'm, I actually have an otter box. I suggest you look into a good case, but um, uh, they're good. So, no, the, the idea is to have something you can actually, even if, you, if your, your smartphone is not waterproof, you can still go back to your desktop, I suppose, and get another copy of it. And, and, and while you say it in jest, I will say that I think the point that, that the representative has with that particular amendment is the fact that we as government need to be always constantly innovating and looking for ways in which we can not only be uh, more effective and efficient from what we do, 
but the way that we can make the lives of the people that uh, we represent that much better. And, and I, this is a phenomenal example. I'm looking forward to it kind of moving on of, of moving with the times and helping our constituents. So with that, I appreciate you being here. Thanks for the questions and uh, have a great rest of the week.